Okay, welcome back. This is the second half of the chapter two recitation. The first part we did was the uh, circular flow diagram, and that is an economic model. The second part here is another kind of simple economic model, but it also has very important conceptual kind of benefits. So what I've drawn here is this production possibility frontier, which we've talked a lot about in lecture. I've drawn it in a bold out fashion like this. And our example in this, this particular problem, because you have them with you, are candles and clocks. And that's kind of silly at some level. Um, I'd rather think of uh, higher education and health care, right? The country is spending more and more of its money on health care. Something's got to give because state budgets can't stand it, you know, can't manage spending more and more on health care at the same time supporting higher education. So what do they do? They're raising your tuition. What are they going to do? They're going to cut back on higher education. What are they going to do? They're going to cut back on support for education to the suburbs, etc. In other words, you have trade-offs. And the trade-offs mean if you want more of one good, you have to give up more of the other. And this very simple model, this production possibility frontier, is going to push this idea of opportunity cost and efficient production. So, we've talked about a lot in class, so I will stop there and we'll jump right to these problems here. So let's go to number six. I've replicated the diagram, which is figure 2-6 in your handout, and it says here, efficient production is represented by which points? So we have all these points here, and which points represent efficient production? Right. Well, the answer is going to be point A and point B, and only point A and point B, because these are on the frontier. These are on the border of the production possibility frontier. And therefore, they represent the efficient use of all the resources available in society, the land, the labor, the physical capital, et cetera, are being used to produce either 30 candles and six clocks, or we could have, in this case, 12 clocks and 15 candles. You can't, but we're along the frontier, you're using your resources most efficiently. So the answer to number six is A and B. If we go to number seven, inefficient production is represented by which points? So inefficient production is when not all the resources are being used effectively. That there are people unemployed, like we have now in the economy. Or there's housing stock that's not being used, which we have now in the economy. Or there are factories that are not being fully utilized by workers, etc. So the points that represent inefficient production are G, C, and F. Okay, because they're inside the production possibility frontier. So that answer is C on your sheet, but I want to make sure you understand why. For example, we can go from G to C, and it's, well, I'm not going to stop there because I think that's one of your next questions. All right, so let's go to number eight. Unemployment could cause this economy to produce at which points? So if there's unemployment in the economy, which points would represent unemployment? All right, again, it's pretty much the same answer. Both C, G, and F are all consistent with an unemployment in the economy. In our economy now, 8 or 9% unemployment, meaning we have workers who are willing to work, for whom there are no jobs, and therefore we can't get out to the efficient use of all. We can't produce more when you're, when you, excuse me, when you're at C, D, or F, we can produce more if we could utilize these workers, but they're not being utilized. There's not enough demand for their services. So the economy is not at an efficient point of production for points C, G, and F. Okay? So that's the answer. Number eight is C. Number nine, if this economy moved from C to F, so if we moved from C to F, what would that mean? Is that a gain? Let's see. It still would not be produced efficiently as A. B, there would be no gain in either candles or clocks. So no gain in the candles or clocks. Well, that's not true. If you go from C to F, you certainly lose candles, but you gain clocks. So B is simply incorrect. C, it would be producing more candles and more clocks in a point C. So F, they're saying, are you producing more candles and more clocks? Well, you're producing more clocks than at C. At C, you're producing six clocks. At F, you're producing, looks like, eight clocks. Okay. So you're producing more clocks at F, but you're producing fewer candles. So the answer to C is incorrect as well. D, it would not be possible for this economy to move from point C to point F without additional resources. So now, you're at C. 
They're saying you can't go from C to F without additional resources in labor or capital or equipment. Answer, wrong. Because you're underutilizing resources at C, there are resources sitting around, unemployed workers, for example, unused housing stock, unused capital stock, that could be applied to get us to F. So the movement from C to F would not be utilizing, you, couldn't, you could move from C to F, and you wouldn't have to utilize, for example, additional resources. You could use the resources that aren't being utilized correctly today. All right? And lastly, it says, what is the opportunity cost of moving from point A to point B? So now you're at point A and you're on the efficiency curve, right? You're on the production possibility frontier. You're using your resources completely efficiently. Point B is also on the production possibility frontier. You're using your resources completely efficiently. So the question is, if you want fewer candles and you want more clocks, or you're at A and you want more clocks, what do you have to give up in terms of candles? Well, if you go from A to B, you cut back on these many candles in order to get this much additional clocks. All right. How much is that? That's 0.30 and 6. And we're going to go from 6 to, to 14. So when you go from A to G, we give up 30 minus 15. We give up 15 candles when you move from point A to point G. All right. What do you gain from it? You gain G, which is 6, out to 14. You're going to gain 8 additional clocks. All right. So the opportunity cost of producing this many additional clocks Right At point A, you're producing 6 clocks, 30 candles. At point B, you're producing 15 candles and 14 clocks. So the point is, you've increased your clocks, but to do that, you had to give up candles. The opportunity cost of having more clocks is less candles. Right? And that amount is 15, so your answer to number 10 is D. Right? So I could ask a lot more questions about this, and we'll stop here, but let me, let me just present a few. All right? D is unattainable. We haven't got the resources to get there. In other words, you, don't, you couldn't have, for example, 25 and 10, 25 candles and 10 clocks. It's beyond your productive capability. We haven't the labor, the land, the resources to do that. So D is inaccessible. Let's say, I, let's say I change this, because I always wanted to do this, and I put education, money spent on education, for example, or schools, how you want to measure it, and here I put health care. This is one of the big trade-offs in our society today. All right? So when I went from A to B, and over the last 30 years, you can make the argument that we've expanded our health care. We've doubled the amount of money we spend on health care over the last 25 years. And, and the sacrifice is we have to give up money spent on other public goods, education, roads. I think the figure was we're spending about 0.6% of GDP on um, infrastructure projects. And 1960, we're spending 2% of GDP on infra in infrastructure projects. In other words, we're spending a lot more on our roads, our tunnels, our railroads. And if you drive around, you'll see they're deteriorating. The point is, healthcare is consuming a lot of our resources and we have to give up other things to get that extra health care. Now, we may value health care. We may want to be at B as opposed to A, but you pay a price for that. And then we have a kind of, you know, we have a society in which the elderly want a lot of health care via Medicare, and they vote in droves, okay? And they have pushed us along this production possibility front here out to B. And you college kids don't vote very much, and you get stuck giving up your educational resources to support health care resources, right? So you're going to pay $300 extra in tuition every year for the next four years after this previous one in order to basically keep ourselves where we are at point A. It's a big price to pay, all right? Anyway, the production possibility frontier is a way to emphasize those trade-offs. There's no such thing as a free lunch. It's a classic economic expression. And what that means is if you want more health care, something else has to give. You want to go from point A to point B, you have to give up something in A to get B. The only way you can get more health care, or in this case, more of B, is if you have some improvement in your technology. So, for example, let's say we could 
make candles really efficiently. And I could push the production possibility front out like that. In other words, just by using my resources more effectively, I could now get more education and more candles. Let's say I went to point, we'll call this point X, for example. At point X, I've got more candles and I have more clocks. The reason I got there is because we had an increase in productivity. Now, if you want to, you could put computers up here. We've made enormous gains in the power of our computers. We've pushed out the, product, the production possibility frontier in computers so, so much that when I was your age and in college, the computer that I used basically filled this room. You now have it basically in a tablet. Okay, so there have been enormous gains in productivity in certain sectors of the economy that's allowed us to have, in this case, more electronics, more computers, more computing power, um, and we didn't have to give up other resources to get there because we've made so much improvements in the efficiency with which how we produce those things. So, again, I've picked this theme up in, in lecture. We'll continue with this in chapter three as we head into trade. But again, the production possibility frontier and the circular flow diagram are two simple models that provide, I think, useful insights into some of the themes we'll be pursuing in this course. All right, all right, I'll stop there. This is our first uh, recitation. I'll see you for the next 15. Bye-bye.